Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here today to celebrate the 11th Ovid Siddiqui Memorial Oration to honor the birthday of the father of the modern biology in India, Professor Ovid Siddiqui. As a molecular geneticist, Dr. Siddiqui worked across several different model organisms from bacteria to Aspergillus to Drosophila. He studied and characterized the structure of genes in Aspergillus and later on, along with Alan Garin, discovered the suppressor of nonsense mutations in bacteria. This later work led to the notion of the stop codons in the genetic code and the mechanism of chain termination during protein synthesis. In the field of neurogenetics, Dr. Siddiqui, along with Seymour Benzer, discovered temperature sensitive paralytic mutants in Drosophila and the generation and transmission of neural signals. He also studied the sense of smell and taste in Drosophila, including how olfactory information is encoded in the brain of the fly and how chemosensory genetics can be used to study this further. Dr. Siddiqui received several accolades during his lifetime, including Shanti Bhatnagar Award in 1976, as well as Padma Vibhushan in 2006. And moreover, he was also a member of several science societies across the world. He was instrumental in setting up the Molecular Biology Unit at TIFR Mumbai and later on went on to become the founder director of TIFR NCBS. He also had a great relationship with our founder director, Professor Partho Pratim Mojumdar. They met in 1997 at a human evolution conference at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And interestingly, Professor Siddiqui went there not as a speaker, but as a learner of human evolution which signifies how much he was passionate about learning new things, even at the age of 65. He was the reviewer of the proposal of the establishment of NIBMG, and eventually he delivered his first foundation lecture of NIBMG on the development of genetics. He succumbed to death from a road accident in 2013, and from the following year, we started to celebrate his birthday to pay tribute to this great scientist. We have with us today one of the renowned population geneticists, Dr. K. Thangaraj from CISR Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, 
who has made important contributions in understanding the complex origin of Indian population as well as health and disease of South Asians. I shall stop here and invite on stage Ms. Madhurima Chakraborty and Mr. Shuprutim Ghosh to begin today's event with our invocation song. Sarvesham swastir bhavatu Sarvesham shantir bhavatu Sarvesham purnam bhavatu Sarvesham mangalam bhavatu Om Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha, Sarve Bhadrani Pashantu, Makas Chidukha Bhagavet, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Niramayaha, Sarve Bhadrani Pashantu, Makas Chidukha Bhagavet. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Now I'd like to invite our director, Dr. Shagur Shengupto, to deliver welcome remarks and to introduce our today's speaker. So, uh, dear friends, colleagues, students, and of course, my friend and scientific journey, which we have done together in some ways, Professor Sathangaraj. It's a pleasure to have Professor Sathangaraj with us for the 11th Ovid Siddhaki Memorial Oration. And uh, it is indeed a pleasure because I think he is eminently suitable to deliver this lecture. Professor Thangara joined CCMB Hyderabad almost, he was just telling me, uh, just before he had even submitted his thesis in 1992, 1993. And now he is back after a detour to CDFD, Hyderabad as director, he completed his tenure and he came back a uh, couple of months, maybe June, he came back in July uh, to CCMB and is the group leader of Evolutionary Medical Genetics Laboratory in CCMB. In many ways, uh, Professor Thangaraj has been a trailblazer he has broad interests on multiple aspects, and I will touch a few of them, like the origin of modern human health and disease, and I will touch on specific aspects of them later. He, tries, he has been interested from the very beginning, right from the beginning, to understand the complex origin and affinities and of Indian population, using the genomic variation as one of the tools, and ancient biological remains. He has done work on that. He is the master of understanding the mitochondrial disorders. Just a few minutes back, we were talking about it. There's male infertility, sex determination. He was instrumental in setting up, uh, in some ways, the forensic genetics and genetic basis of the, even the Ayurveda Prakritis. He is interested in understanding the impact of endogamy on human health and disease of the South Asians. So over a period of time, Thangaraj has actually contributed hugely 
on each of the above aspects which I mentioned. For instance, right back in when many of you were probably in school yet, yet pro in 2005 in a science paper, celebrated science paper, he provided the evidence that tribal populations of Andaman the Islands are the first modern humans who migrated out of Africa. So later on in a again an equally celebrated nature paper in 2009, he had shown that the present day Indian population descend from two drivers group, namely the ancestral South Indians and ancestral North Indians, the ASI and ANI. He went ahead with this concept and he went deeper into that. And he found that the ASI ANI had admixed during the past, say about 4,000 years and then followed strict endogamy leading to population specific recessive diseases. And some of these aspects probably he will touch upon in today's talk. In addition to basic research, uh, Thangaraj and his team have been pioneers in the DNA fingerprinting services for establishing biological relationships in medical legal purposes. He was the most apt choice for CDAP directorship. He has published numerous papers in, I have mentioned a few, and even in Lancet, Nature Genetics, and American Journal of Human Genetics. He's an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, Indian National Academy of Biological Sciences. And I came to know Thangaraj over a period of time during our common interest on mitochondrial biology. And he's the founder and secretary of the Mitochondrial Society of Mitochondrial Research and Medicine, which is probably a unique society which actually tries to bring in from the clinicians to the basic biologists. Yes, uh, the country has also recognized his contributions in different fields. He has been the adjunct visiting professor in Manipal uh, University, recipients of many awards, including the Raman Research Fellowship. So again, coming back to the what I started with, he is a very apt person to give today's talk, the 11th of its Siddhiki oration. And dear friends, I, am, I would like to welcome Thangaraj to the stage. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank uh, Professor Sagar for many things. First, for giving me honor to deliver a talk, which honors Professor Obed Siddiqui. Also, summarizing my talk. So, he has beautifully narrated, I think, that's a summary of my talk. And uh, very good evening to all of you. And that's my pleasure and feel honored to deliver 11th Obed Siddiqui Memorial Oration. I don't know how he identified me, but it's my pleasure to be here. And I had a very brief uh, time interacting with uh, Professor Ubed Siddiqui, just one day, very brief time. That was when uh, CCMB organized, Dr. Lalji Singh organized the third international DNA fingerprinting in uh, 1994, where he came to chair a session. So that was the only time I had a fortunate to uh, interact with him very briefly. And I liked uh, this picture because he also liked this picture. That's why I kept this because there are many color photographs. 
when we asked him at that time, because I was deeply involved in making um, abstract books, souvenir and so on. So he sent this picture. <laughs> so once again, it's my pleasure and thank uh, Professor Sagar Sengupta for giving me this honor. So when you talk about so population genomics, there is no other country which stands very close to India because of the kind of diversity which we have in India. Even without going into details of uh, genetics or genomics, by looking at the phenotype, you will understand how complex the Indian populations are. There are some populations who typically look like Africans, some typically look like Europeans, some of them like with the uh, uh, Southeast Asian phenotype, and some are very unique to India. So they don't look like any other people, but they are uh, typically Indians. And uh, very interesting to note, I want to highlight this, that we all know, but Mark Twain is an American writer. What he said about India is that <coughs> India is the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, and the great grandmother of tradition. Our most valuable and most instructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India only. Okay. You can imagine that how people from outside value uh, India. Coming to some of the unique features of India is the stratification. So Indian population broadly stratified into uh, many groups based on the language. There are four major linguistic groups. One is Dravidians. Again, there are four languages, Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada, and Telugu. Similarly, Austroasiatic, it has its own languages. Tibet or Burman who lives in uh, northeastern, northern part of India. And Indo-European, about 80% of the people in India speak Indo-European language. So in addition to that, there are several isolated languages including Andamanis, Nihalis, and few more. In addition to that, there are social stratification, so-called the caste system, so-called upper caste, middle caste, lower caste, tribes, primitive tribes, and religious groups, so on. So that makes India as one of the very complex nation in terms of population <coughs> diversity. How such huge complexity arose in India? If you wanted to understand, I think I have to take you back several tens of thousands of years back, or even more than that. And let's look at how the modern human arose. I think most of you are aware that the modern human arose in Africa about 160 to 200,000 years back. And they migrated to different part of the world and they now has been occupied in almost every continent. And the question is that how did they migrate? Whether they took northern route or southern route. Some of the historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, <coughs> including geneticists, they believe that the first modern human probably taken the northern land route. But others did not believe on that, probably because the climatic condition might not have helped them to move towards north. So therefore, they believed on the southern coastal route. So all these are based on the archaeological evidence present in many places. Archaeological evidence in Australia suggests that the modern human might have reached Australia about 50,000 years back. China about 39,000 years back, Middle East 47,000 years back, and Europe 40,000 years back. But unfortunately, we don't have any strong archaeological evidence <laughs> to suggest that when did the modern human might have arrived in the Indian subcontinent. There are few archaeological evidence, but 
they are not giving enough information. Just to name you a few, it's a place called Jawalapuram in Andhra Pradesh. Archaeologists <coughs> have excavated and found a lot of stone tools which modern human might have used for hunting for their food. But unfortunately, <coughs> there was no biological remains to analyze and come to some conclusion. And these are very recent excavation that there is a place called Kiradi near Madurai. They found two intact skeletons. But again, these are not very old, maybe around 3,000, 4,000 year old. Another place called Archanallur, again in South Tamil Nadu. There are a few bone samples which are almost fragmented, which we are trying to analyze. There are many such sites, but unfortunately, not uh, either old or even they are old, uh, there is no uh, biological remain, even if we find biological remains not in an analyzable condition. The only successful uh, study which we could do in collaboration with many uh, including the archaeologist uh, Dr. Vashan Sinde who excavated the place in Harappa and found this intact uh, skeleton of a woman, a place called Rakigiri here. We analyzed and we found that uh, the Harappan sample is not very old, maybe around 3000 BCE. And that consists of two different kind of genome. One is the Andamanis, which I will come a bit later, the majority of them are Iranian hunter-gatherer. But not Iranian farmers. That means they must have migrated long back, but the age of the sample is only 3000 BCE, not going to give much information about early human migration. This also has some of the other interpretation like agriculture must have started independently because Iranians, uh, uh, Iranian farmers have not come and they have come much, much long back. Um, so the agriculture must have started independently. This is one of the largest ancient DNA study, again led by David Rhee. There are 500 bone samples have been analyzed, majority of them are from Central Asia. Of course, we used contemporary sample and try to analyze and see whether that helps us in understanding uh, the early human migration. But again, it's not giving enough information. We found that Yamnaya strepi fossilized who have migrated to India through Kazakhstan and also they migrated to Europe. But the age, if you look at, they are only 2000-2000 BCE same way here, but probably they are the one who brought the Indo-European language to both India and taken to uh, Europe. So in the absence of strong archaeological evidence, we thought that looking at the contemporary population's genetic information probably help us in understanding the origin migration of uh, the modern human and fully understanding the complexity, uh, how such a huge number of population diversity exists in India. We have done some studies and uh, just these are some of the population specific uh, studies and these are some of the regional specific or linguistic specific studies. These are broader studies and these are study outside India. But the talk which I am going to talk to you is going to have very limited number of uh, studies which I am going to talk. Uh, one is the Andamanis work because some of the work which are very important to understanding the population history uh, uh, are the one which I am going to highlight here. So we try to understand the origin of uh, our own gaze. We went and collected the samples and uh, we have been using three different kind of uh, markers. One is the mitochondrial 
DNA marker or whole mitochondrial genome, which we all inherit from the mother. We also use the Y chromosome markers, all the males inherit from the father to trace the paternal lineage, this is to trace the maternal lineage. And we also use the autosomal markers, particularly happen the whole genome was sequenced and there is a array which consists of 1 million uh, SNPs are now available. When we use the complete mitochondrial DNA sequence, based on the mutation, of course, most of you are aware, based on the mutation exists in the mitochondrial genome, we can classify and make into different haplogroups. Those SNPs are evolutionarily conserved. The parsimonious tree suggests that the root of mitochondrial haplogroup, that's L1, L2, and L3, is restricted to Africa. And as a, we acquire mutation, they fall into different haplogroups. M haplogroup is predominant in uh, India, as you see that uh, Europe has different set of haplogroups, and Asia, East Asia has a different set of haplogroups, Australia and PNG Island have different set of haplogroups. That means every population, they acquired when they are in isolation, therefore that mutations helps in assigning a specific haplogroup. When we sequence the mitochondrial DNA of uh, Andaman tribes, but to our surprise, we expect that because their phenotype is similar to Africans, but we, ex um, but we found that they are not falling into any of the L derived haplogroup, but they, are, uh, they have acquired large number of mutations. And based on that, we assigned a new haplogroup called M31 and M32. And also, we estimated the age of the population turned out to be 65,000 to 70,000 years. So, based on that, we proposed that probably Andamanis are the first modern human, must have migrated out of Africa, taking southern coastal route and reached Andaman and Nicobar Islands about 65,000 to 70,000 years back. In the same issue of science, there was another study by <coughs> Michaelis group where they studied a population called Orang Asli from uh, Malaysia and they also come to the same conclusion. Peter Foster and uh, uh, Matsumura, they have written a perspective in the, uh, the same issue highlighting both the articles and suggesting this is the possible way of early human migration. So that's, that's one of the important uh, study where we have shown that uh, the early human who migrated out of Africa taking southern coastal route and they are none other than the Andamanis. After that, we wanted to use the nuclear genome, particularly the autosomal markers, where the Affymetrix and Illumina are also now are making uh, the uh, arrays which consist of 1 million SNPs. So now we selected population representing all the linguistic groups, Dravidians, Indo-European, Austro-Asiatic, Tibeto-Burman and Andamanese. We also used uh, in this study human genome diversity panel and HapMap data set. So what we have shown here actually that helped us in reconstructing the Indian population history. So although we have four linguistic group, two of them Austroasiatic and to Burman, they have some kind of genetic affinities with outside India. Therefore, we have not included in this. In the PCA plot, you have seen these are all Indian population. This is a European half map sample, African half map sample, and this is Chinese half map sample. While they were in a tight clusters, all the three, suggesting that genetically they are more homogeneous, there are lot many individuals. But whereas, look at Indians, every single population is very unique. But again, the clusters are not somewhere around this uh, region or in the plot. 
but they are systematically arranged to suggest that every single population is unique, but still there is some kind of genetic affinities between the group. So that means broadly, in a sense, we can say that unity in diversity. So, what we have shown is that in the prehistoric India, there were two founding population. One is ancestral South Indian, other one is ancestral North Indian. Probably the ancestral South Indian was part of this early human migration, migrated from Africa. And they, some of them have settled in southern part of India, maybe in Kerala or Tamil Nadu. And they are the one South, ancestral South Indian. The second wave probably brought people um, not as, as shown in uh, the paper, whom we call as ancestral North Indian, who are also genetically somewhat sharing some kind of genetic affinities with European. There are some mutations like skin color mutation, which is found uh, in Europe, Middle East, and northern part of India. And uh, the Y chromosome haplogroup R1A1 is also common in Europe. Middle East and Northern part of India. Those are saying that there is some kind of genetic affinities with the Europeans. So these are the two founding populations. And these two founding populations have admixed at some point of time, which I will come back a bit later. So what else we have shown is after admixing that they, we also refuted the Aryan invasion theory and predicted that there could be high frequency of recessive mutation in India. That was all the prediction. When talk about the population diversity, apart from these two founding group, in the recent past, there were several populations who have migrated into India, like historically, like Alexander's army military conquest of Arab and Turks, British colonization, and there are a few population groups like Siddhis, <coughs> Jewish population, and Parsis have migrated very recently. To understand that what happened to Siddhis, they are the Bandu speaking Africans and they have been brought by Portuguese traders to work in the army of Nawab and Sultan. They are in Gujarat, Karnataka and also in Telangana, particularly in Hyderabad. And mostly the males have come. That is the reason if you see the, uh, the uh, African Siddhis and Indians, their Y chromosome is more of Africans, but more of uh, Indians mitochondrial DNA. So they have admixed after coming here. Similarly, the Jewish populations, you can see that these are Indian Jews. You can see the blue one is the Middle Eastern component, very tiny. That means they are thoroughly admixed and mostly they carry the Indian uh, genome. And the Parsis is the one who still have, compared to other Indian population, still they have lot more of their original Parsi genome that and they still practice endogamy therefore large number of disease as you all aware in Parsi. So all of these the founding population subsequent migrations makes and admixing with the Indian population makes India as one of the complex nation as I mentioned earlier. And we have, because of all of these, we have 4,635 anthropologically well-defined population groups. As I mentioned earlier, no other country has such a huge human diversity, including a large number of tribes, primitive tribes, and half of them still follow hunters and gatherers like type. So coming to the admixture which I mentioned between ancestral North Indian and ancestral South Indians, to understand that we took uh, another study uh, taking large number of population from South and large number of population from North and we have demonstrated that these two founding groups 
must have initially gave rise to many populations. Something you can imagine that the population initially settled in a jungle and after completing available food, one group must have moved to other place. And if they stayed uh, away from the founder group for a very long time, the founder group must have acquired some mutation. The, the group which moved out of that might acquire a different set of mutations. Similarly, every time they diverge and uh, the divergent period is much, much long period. So each one acquired their own set of uh, mutations. So that's how it happened. Uh, ASI and ANI uh, independently gave rise to many population. But what happened during last two to four thousand years, they are admixed. The genome is ad admixed. That's the reason we have seen that the, the gradient of cluster in one of the PCA. Then after admixing, every single population started maintaining the endogamy. Okay. So that is because the caste system which arose around 1500 years back must have put more pressure on every single population to maintain the endogamy. So now I will take you through the health and disease aspect of the practice of endogamy which Indian population, most of the population even today practice for last 2000 years. To do that, this time we do not want to restrict only analyzing the Indian population. We thought of analyzing South Asian all of them together. Now if you include all other South Asian countries, the population size is nearly 5000. Again, huge amount of uh, diversity. So the reason why we wanted to expand the study to South Asia is that there are a couple of examples. One example which I will give you here. In one of the studies where we found a mutation uh, that is a 25 base pair deletion, a gene called myosin binding protein C3 gene which causes a disease called cardiomyopathy. That is a heart muscle disease. There are three different kinds of cardiomyopathies. Dilated, hypertrophy and restrictive cardiomyopathy. If the 25 base per deletion exists in a homozygous condition, then the individual die at very, very early age. That we detected by looking at the post-mortem tissue of the children who have died because of cardiac arrest. It is a dilation of heart. This is hypertrophy, thickening of heart muscle. But if the mutation exists in the heterozygous condition, the individual live up to 45 or 40 or 45 years without any symptoms. But suddenly when they are more active, like cycling or uh, running, they would collapse. Okay. After detecting that in a case control, we try to look at how it is distributed all over India. We found all over India, in 6,273 samples, uh, sample, on average, 4.5 percent of them are carrying the mutation in a heterozygous condition. Right? And then we did not find that in Andaman and Nicobar Islands and also in the Northeast because they have migrated much long back because later on we estimated this mutation must have arose somewhere in the mainland around. 80,000 years back. And because of the admixture, one mutation, and in the heterozygous condition, is not going to cause any disease, he or she marries and transmitting to the next generation. So that is how it got well spread across India. So our population study helps us for better understanding how this would have well spread. Then we went on to see how it is distributed all over the world and we found that to surprisingly it is restricted to only in South Asian countries but not in other countries. So that means whatever we study in India this is also true for other South Asian countries. Any mutation we find we may expect that mutation also in other South Asian countries. Therefore, we wanted to include all the South Asian countries in this study. So we included 2,800 individuals from 
275 endogamous group from all south asian countries including sri lanka pakistan um, bangladesh nepal and so on and of course the color indicates their linguistic background and in this study very interestingly found there is a lot of possibility to map a population specific recessive disease. How we did? This is the IBD score, identity by descent. is quite high among large number of Indian populations. Some of them are even higher than the Ashkenazi Jewish and Finnish population. So every single line represent one population and the length of the IBD, you can see some of the populations are having multiple higher IBD. That means within the population, if you analyze more number of individuals, they all mostly share a common haplotype. So the reason why just to a comparison, you can imagine that with the tiny IBD score, of Ashkenazi Jewish and Finnish population, there are large number of diseases has been mapped. These are the diseases, these are the genes and mostly they are autosomal recessive. So dominant, no problem, whosoever is having mutation, they are going to express the disease. But the problem with the recessive is that heterozygous mutation, again the endogamy is going to increase its frequency. As long as it is in the heterozygous condition, no problem at all. But the two individuals with the heterozygous mutation, they marry, that's where the problem is going to start. So to explain you that although you all are aware that in this pedigree, for example, this is a female, male and husband and wife, they have two daughters and you imagine this is a heterozygous mutation in one of the pair and the husband doesn't have, therefore the mutation goes in heterozygous condition to the next generation. Again, both of them married somebody from outside without that mutation. So, no issue at all. It's going in heterozygous condition. But now, after few generations, they are from the same community. They may feel that they are unrelated. Because any large uh, number of individuals in the community, they all must have come from a common ancestor. But after few generations, they may see that oh, they are unrelated. That's what happened. So they, both of them carry mutation in a heterozygous condition. If they marry, statistically, as a one-fourth of chance that they are going to transmit this mutation to the next generation, therefore, there is a disease. To prove that, whatever we predicted, we took one of the disease called progressive pseudorheumatoid dysplasia. It is a well-known autosomal recessive disease uh, uh, from, it's caused by WSP. Uh, three gene mutation and in the age of onset is very very young and the children get the swelling of uh, all the joints you can see the uh, x-ray also showing uh, the swelling with very painful this is autosomal recessive parents are absolutely fine with the heterozygous mutation we took some 30 patients and sequenced and found six of them carrying the mutation then we sequence the flanking region of the mutation and found five out of the six are having the same haplotype, suggesting that although today they say they are unrelated, they are all the five must have come from a common ancestor. Okay. So that is very, very high among Indian population. In fact, we predicted that one third of the Indian populations are expected to have a population specific recessive disease. This is one example which I wanted to show about the heterozygous uh, predominant in the population. The autosomal uh, gene polymerase gamma, uh, Professor Saga Sengupta has worked uh, extensively on that. This is a nuclear gene, but it is essential for mitochondrial DNA replication. If there is a mutation, single base mutation, what you see here, C2T, parents are heterozygous as shown here, CT, CT, but unfortunately, two of their children carrying the homozygous mutation, therefore, there is a disease that includes 
uh, encephalopathy sees a stroke like episode and most importantly it's leading to premature death okay in two family one you can see consanguineous family parents are absolutely fine this is non consanguineous family but still the mutation highly prevalent that means they are endogamy what they practice is the cause for that and this mutation apart from what we see here the lesions on the brain this is about uh, 10 kb 9.9 kb fragment of wild type and you can see the patient has multiple mitochondrial dna deletion okay and you can also see that uh, th this is one of the features of uh, mitochondrial disorders accumulation of abnormal mitochondria within the sarcoma and this is a cox negative fiber so this condition is another example to show that how prevalent the heterozygous mutation in the community this is another example again this is a mitochondrial related autosomal gene uh, which causes chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia another mitochondrial disease you can see uh, these two individuals having bilateral stosis trooping up eyelid attacks and uh, many more complication ultimately to um, vision loss again you can see that uh, this is a control parents are with heterozygous mutation and this is a homozygous mutant as you see here so it's quite highly prevalent among various indian population groups now having this because when we uh, collected the sample we don't have any clue at all about all this 275 population which includes 200 2800 individuals or there any disease in the population but we predicted so we wanted to go back and see the population we included few population including color uh, yadav from pandicherry and uh, there are few more we did the exome sequencing and parallelly we went back to some of the population and surprisingly we found this population called color which is in tamil nadu is one of the population with high ibd score as a disease prevalence of junctional herlitz epidermolysis bullosa once again it's a recessive disease recessive mutation parents are absolutely fine the children was a uh, all the lesions including the oral mucosities and congenital heart disease my students have gone there and collected the sample and we did the exome sequencing and found this 11 base pair deletion a gene called lamb3 so not only that when we went into the population we found there are eight families there are multiple such children with uh, ultimately they have to die in a few months having known that we went back again to try to help the family and asked is there any pregnant woman so that we can do prenatal diagnosis there was one woman but this very remote place we could not collect amniotic fluid there brought that mother to chennai and with the help of some of my collaborators we collected the amniotic fluid and we simply design primer such a way that it amplifies and come to know whether it's a deletion heterozygous or homozygous and you can see that this is a homozygous heterozygous and the amniotic fluid carrying the heterozygous and we further sequence where you can see both mother and uh, the amniotic fluid shows the heterozygous uh, um, kind of peak here because of the deletion then we advise and the mother went back and it's our joy to see this a child born with the perfect feature no problem at all so that gives much more joy 
rather than only doing the basic research, we could help the population and the family to have much better, uh, you can imagine what would be the mental trauma of the parents who have the children with the disease and dying, but we could help. Not only this, the second, again, another one more lady, this time we could collect the amniotic fluid in mother itself. And again, we found that uh, the amniotic fluid carrying heterozygous mutation. And we also wanted to make sure whether whatever we are amplifying is of maternal DNA or not. So we did uh, STR profiling of uh, mother and the amniotic fluid. In fact, we found that one allele from mother and this is another allele which come from the father. And the STR profiles are different. Therefore, it comes on, uh, confirms that, uh, so whatever we find that is in the amniotic fluid. Therefore, again, we adv uh, advise the mother to continue with the pregnancy. <coughs> and the child born few days back, I tried to get the photograph, I think, uh, there was, uh, they are busy, they could not get it. So, so two at least, the same population where there is a multiple uh, such disease and we could save uh, and help the, the family with the normal children. So, to understand the basic biology of uh, the mutation, we have seen the, what is the impact of that. In fact, this is a full length high type gene which has 11, uh, uh, 1172 amino acids, whereas because of the 11 base pair deletion, there is a truncation of protein which has only 799 amino acids. Then we wanted to create animal model using CRISPR Cas. We deleted the 11 base pair deletion, uh, 11 base pair uh, uh, DNA sequence. Uh, using this uh, strain and in fact these are heterozygous but in human heterozygous does not give any phenotypic uh, feature. But in the, in, the, in the animal you can see including absence of nail in uh, some of the uh, animals and you can see the rashes and this is a dissected animal even this you can see the inflammation internal inflammation in the intestine. So that tells that yes, whatever the mutation present because the novel mutation is be, is really causing the phenotype. Then we went back to the population to understand uh, there are several region in Tamil Nadu. These are the different places. Place called Pudukote, somewhere here, Trichy, then Madurai, Melur are here and Sivaganga. Sivaganga is here. Then we try to collect sample from all these places. Initially we found only in Sivaganga, but it surprisingly we did not find the mutation in although large number in Melo. Many of them does not have the mutation, but it is restricted to only in Sivaganga, although the same population. That means there is a Again, substructure, it is not easy to understand, okay, this is a population specific, there is a fine substructure is existing because it is present only in this particular uh, region, Sivaganga. Then we try to analyze some of the population which we have. This is from our lab, 2477 individuals. Genome India, because most of you are aware, we have Genome India project C2 sequence, 10,000 individuals. Uh, NIBMG is one of the uh, important partner of that to sequence, Analaba and Nidan, and many others are involved in that. We looked at quickly 5,750, there is no such mutation. In the genome, 1000 plus sample, nothing was there, totally 9,250 sample. So, none of them carrying this mutation. I said about substructures, so went on to do, we parallelly was doing the mitochondrial DNA analysis and we just looked at the haplogroups, Madurai, Pudukote, Sivaganga, Trichy and you can see that the haplogroup diversity is very, very less and one particular haplogroup or 30B is very predominant here, whereas that is not a, uh, almost nearly here and some amount of 
that is here, but huge amount of diversity, but not much of diversity. So, there is a very strong population structure exists there. The marriage is within that village, okay, that makes even more complex. And this is not the first time, this is another study parallel now we are looking at the population called Kurd in collaboration with uh, Prasthelma Thelma from <coughs> Delhi University. This is again very specific community living in a very, very small region. And again, our surprise that uh, this paper is under consideration, um, not published yet. The Kurg are now, this is Kurg 1, 2, and this Kurg 3. You can see that very, very strong substructure. It's a small population group because it's not there in many parts of the country, it's restricted to only there. So they are similar to very strong drift. Uh, uh, as you see in some other population like uh, Udadan and Gujar, uh, the group 3 is here. Okay. So, there is a lot more work which we have done. I am not going to detail, just to show that the population, not we cannot consider population <coughs> as a whole because there is a lot more thing to understand. Then we went on to look at how it is distributed all over the uh, the genome which are available. We found there is only one in genome AD, that is the South Asian, but they are uh, not able to reveal the background of the population. So, altogether it is 3,74,497 individual, there is only one that 11 base per deletion, that to South Asian, probably they must have gone the, the population from Sivaganga color must be the, uh, the one individual. So, just we were discussing about rare disease, this is extremely rare when you look at all over the world, but if you go to a specific community, again it is distributed 4 percent and leading to very severe disease which lead to that more problem to the community. So, now what we are thinking? Of, uh, we are again going back to the population. We had a camp during collection of sample for Genome India. So, we had a camp to collect large number of individuals where we can screen them and of course, those who have crossed reproductive age are fine, but the children and those who are in reproductive age are very, very important to get to know their genotype, whether they carry 11 base per deletion or not. So, that we are also approaching the state medical health department for their help to go and screen the entire population. Therefore, subsequent uh, screening may help of a few generations to avoid or eliminate this mutation from the population itself. It happened for uh, Ashkenazi Jewish, they systematically eliminated a couple of mutation. They have an organization called Dor Eshrim and they do uh, screening of uh, the well-known mutations in the community. So, having this background, when I was in uh, CDFD, so I initiated a program called Pediatric Rare Disease and uh, fully understood that how complex it is and is necessary for a common people. And there are several uh, laboratories or institute which are involved uh, are involved in routine diagnostics are participated uh, in this, it is an ongoing program and they do initial screening and uh, they find some known mutation, then they do not send, if they do not find mutation, then sample goes to CDFD, do the exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, identify <coughs> the mutation, you predict it, <coughs> it has some pathogenic um, implication, then develop animal model uh, and also try to treat some of the very limited uh, diseases and one of the uh, important program is making awareness um, and if uh, somebody want to look at the website and go to uh, CDFD and there are short videos in eight different languages to give information to the public to get to know more about this. So, this program was in fact launched um, uh, in Hyderabad by Secretary DBT, Dr. 
Rajesh Gokhale and uh, there are a lot of uh, news coverage and everybody because this is public interest uh, program and this is going well I am sure that it will have very strong impact on the general public. Uh, with that I conclude my talk by thanking there are a large number of uh, contributed to the study right from the mentor to a lot of colleagues and students, a lot of collaborators uh, within India, outside India, the list goes. And finally, want to also acknowledge uh, the funding agencies like CSAR, UK, that's a UK uh, India Education Research Initiative Grant, DBT, DST, and Medical Research Council at London. So, with that, uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, once again, I'm really happy to be here. and. Uh, Exactly. Sure. Any question? No question. No question. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, it is my pleasant duty from, uh, on, the, on behalf of MIBMG to thank our honorable speaker, uh, Professor Shankaraj. Thank you so much for taking out time and visiting MIBMG. Uh, your talk was certainly scintillating. As faculty, we are all very inspired, and I'm sure all our students are also inspired. And thank you for taking us on the journey, which not in, uh, only involves movement of people, but also movement in the lab, where you, know, you uh, find something in a disease then you convert it into a functionalization and you've taken it all the way to testing. And that also is a fantastic journey. So thank you very much for sharing your day with us. And I hope you visit again, uh, us again soon. Uh, I thank our director, uh, Professor Sagar Shari Mukta. I don't think that, I, I hope all of you agree that there was not a more apt speaker to be invited for this uh, uh, level of So we thank you, sir, for inviting Professor Kangaraj. Uh, as you are aware, none of this happens without uh, a logistics team. So I thank the director's secretary, both Seema Ji and Sudarshish for doing all the logistics to get Professor Sangaraj here. I also thank our administration for organizing uh, the day, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Navarun and his team, and particularly Sujit for a sumptuous lunch. And I hope you enjoyed that uh, also, sir. Um, without uh, much ado, I think we can come to a close for this program and on behalf of NIBMG and everyone, I thank our speaker again. Uh, thank you. Please have a round of applause. I know the talk, but I this is all, every time I hear it, I get, get ready. Please, we're going to
long journey around. We will put this into your bag. We'll give it. Uh, Alpana? Yeah. Get this thing back. Yeah. No, no, I just said that. This one, this one. Is that a box? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 